got a lot of questions from beginning composers on how to take chords and melody from a piano um, sketch and orchestrate it. So this is going to be kind of a basic orchestration tutorial. We're not going to, I mean we could spend weeks and months on orchestration but we're going to just go through some of the basics and the way I teach orchestration to some of my uh, composition students. So basically I try to relate everything to the ranges of the voice, the uh, singing voice. So in terms of orchestration we can omit mezzo-soprano and baritone for now. So I, I think of things as soprano, alto, tenor, and bass instruments and within each instrumental choir of the orchestra. So what we're going to do in this video is we're going to take a little sketch that I made of a melody and harmony and bass and orchestrate it for the different groups and then we're going to uh, you know we're going to go through winds, brass, strings and then then we're going to talk about some combinations. So let's start with the ranges here. I got a picture of the vocal ranges that I'm going to put up and so you see the soprano goes from middle C to high C uh, above the staff, the uh, treble staff. And then, but then when we have woodwinds, we, we have something like the piccolo flute that can go way above that. So we're going to talk about that too, but, but in general, that's the soprano range. Then the alto um, would go from roughly that F below middle C to D on the staff. So they kind of overlap a little bit there. And when you think of the alto instruments in, in say, like a the string ensemble, we think of the viola being the alto instrument, which can actually go down to that the C below that F. So it can go down to the C into the bass staff there. But moving on, then we have the tenor, which goes from C, which is, is actually what we talked about with the viola, C to up to uh, G. And then the bass voice finally goes from that E below the staff to the uh, E above above the bass, bass staff. But in terms of strings, if we think of strings, we think of the bass actually going even lower than that. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that when we talk about instruments, but but something like the bassoon though you know I, I think of the cello and the bassoon more like tenor instruments than bass instruments even though they go lower than some of these vocal ranges but so every group of instruments is a little different and we'll go over that but it's it's I think it's useful to think in terms of the singing voice when you write for orchestra um, it just helps you organize your your where the ranges are for the instruments, but there are of course exceptions. So let's let's go into the woodwinds now. Let's talk about the ranges of of the winds. Like I said, the piccolo is sounds an octave higher, so it goes pretty far up there. So sometimes you know if you have a really dense or orchestration, the piccolo is really good because it can cut through. And it gives you that higher, higher voice there, that sort of reinforces. You know, if you double something an octave lower, it reinforces that melody. So that's the piccolo. Then we have the the flute, which goes from middle C up through. It can go quite a bit above the the staff there, depending on the player. But as you get higher there, it's going to get very, and this is something too, is the, the character of all the instruments, which, like I said, we could spend a lot of time on this, but when you start to get higher there in the flute, they lose their dynamic um, ability to, you know, play softer. So that those higher notes there are going to be really loud. So that's when you would use the piccolo, when you start to get way above the staff there. Okay, then we have the oboe, which 
overlaps with the flute, but you know, we have a different color because of the double reeds, so it goes from D uh, right above middle C to the C above the staff. So that's that's one of the things we're going to talk about is that it's going to give you a different color than the flute even though it kind of overlaps in the range there. It's a little more limited in range than the than the flute and it gets very sort of pinched up top loses a lot of its like weight. Uh, it's, it sounds a bit strained as you get higher and higher. Um, it can go above that C, but like I said, you don't want to go too far above that. And depending on the oboe, it can also go below that D there, down to B flat, which you could see on the extended ranges um, diagram there. Okay, then we have the English horn, or the cor anglais, which um, has a, l a lower range than the oboe. So it's going to sound better when you start to get below middle C there. Um, it sounds actually a fifth lower than written, so it's one of the transposing instruments. So we can get down to E, or in some cases E flat, uh, depending on the, the 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 B extension of the instrument, the, the fingering uh, key. So that's useful for getting a nice sound um, below below the oboe there, and it still has a lot of weight down there. Okay. So that's flute and oboes, flutes and oboes. Now, let's talk about uh, clarinets and bassoons. So I would say, I mean, the woodwinds have the, the largest variety of instruments of the orchestra. I mean, aside from percussion, but, you know, there's a lot of brass too, but I think in general, you can get a lot of different colors with the winds between the single reed, double reed, and the, the, uh, the flutes. So let's talk about some clarinets here. We have, and we're not going to go through, you know, when we start to orchestrate, we're not going to use a lot of the, we're going to use the B-flat clarinet, but there's also an E-flat clarinet, which is, which is really nice for higher melodies. But when we do this, for we're going to keep it simple and just stick with the B-flat clarinet. We might do some stuff with the bass clarinet, which sounds, uh, an octave below the clarinet. So the clarinets are transposing instruments. So so this is this talks about the uh, written and the sounding range of the instrument. But in general I think of the clarinet as it's kind of an alto instrument, the B flat clarinet, because it overlaps but it can also go higher. It has a quite quite a large range so it can act as both an alto instrument and a soprano as well, so it's it's pretty versatile, um, and it's a great. It really blends well with the strings. It doesn't stand out as much as something like um, oboe, so it, it's a, it can blend really well. Has a warmer t kind of tone. So the bass clarinet can go a lot lower, and and you, we think of that a more like a tenor instrument. And then, of course, the bass instrument would be the bassoon, and then we have the contrabassoon, which is a contrabass instrument. So, the bassoon uh, is as sounding. So we're not going to spend too much time on this. You could you could look in your orchestration book for all this stuff, but I just wanted to do a little overview. So yeah, the bassoon is double reed, goes pretty low. Um, so that's something that you would would double, say, like the cello, right? They're in the same kind of range, and then we have the contrabassoon, which would double, like the contrabass, or would act as that. So we're going to talk about that. So let's get started with uh, with some. We're going to talk about the melody first that I came up with, and so there are different. Let's let's pull up that the melody here that I that I did.
So let's talk about the phrasing of this. It's it's an eight bar phrase, four bars, and then another four, I would say, is the phrasing. Kind of like an antecedent consequent phrase or question and answer type thing. So it starts, um, it actually starts in B major because we have the, the B. I wanted to play around with the major and minor third for this. So in the harmony, we'll talk about the harmony later, but. And then we're gonna think about like what instrument would, would this be comfortable for in the woodwinds. So it gets pretty high. So I would say the flute, it would be a really good melody for the flute and also the clarinet and and the oboe also. So I think any of those could handle that. So that's the melody. Now let's see how we harmonize it here. Now normally when um, this is the kind of thing that you would do, the beginning composers would do as a piano sketch. So this is the what I call the root position example. This has the harmony and the bass in it. So all my chords here, you know, I mean, when you're sketching something out, you may just do root position chords. But it's, it, I think it's important to try to think of, of um, the inversions and and smooth voice leading. And we're going to talk about that as we go along. But you know, I have to, may have to split this video up into a couple things because this is a lot to talk about. But so the first chord we have is the B major chord, and then it falls down to the B minor when we introduce that D natural in the melody, right? So the roots for that and the bass would be B, of course. And then we go up to the D major and D minor chord. All right, but I'm keeping it all in root position here just to show you. But the problem with that is when you think of orchestration, you have to remember that individual voices are playing these notes. That's why I like to think of the singing voice. Try to imagine someone singing these things. So if they have to skip around a lot, it's going to not sound as smooth as you want with this harmony. So you have to think of notes that are being doubled. Like we have this D natural in the B minor chord going to D in the next chord. But underneath that we have a B and instead of go up to that A, in fact, let's pull up, let me just pull up the other, the voice leading example. So I took the same thing here, then I sh I'm going to show you some voice leading stuff that I did, meaning how I changed the chords here and inverted it. So you notice when I went from the B major to the B minor chord, I transposed that B uh, up an octave for the next chord because I wanted that to fall down to the A of the D major chord. So that was the thought process there. And then that F sharp then falls to the F natural for the D minor chord. Now we go to a G major and I kept that instead of go up to the G major chord in root position I kept the D. So we have the G now in um, second inversion, which is the fifth on the bass. And then going from G to B minor here, I made some changes later on, but we'll talk about that. But there's no real way to, you know, we have this B that's tied over. Um, we could have kept a D um, down there, but I wanted to move it up because then we, because if you notice the melody is getting higher, and we want to keep, that's another thing we have to consider is the spacing between the melody and the harmony. And we don't want to, I mean, we can have a lot of space. That's, a you know, something you could do. But I wanted to keep the space a little closer here. So, so I decided to put that D up there. And then that climbs further to the C sharp chord, um, C sharp major, which then, I then for the, it went with the melody here, but I then went for the inversion, um, first inversion, so the third in the bass, because then that's going to lead to the next chord, which is an F. So I'm trying to think of this top note 
of all these chords as a melody and an interesting melody. So that's what you kind of have to think about. Um, okay, and then it, so then it goes to the F major chord and then a C sharp augmented chord, which is like an altered dominant type thing, which then resolves to the F minor chord. So it's pretty standard here what I did with the bass. I'm pretty much keeping all the roots here. And then that brings us to the next example, which I'm going to do some bass movement in the bass. And so why is that important? Well, let's let's bring up the example. So now I have some passing notes between um, in the second measure between B and D, right? And then in, in the next measure, um, I outline the D minor chord in measure four. So it starts with the fifth, goes fifth, third, and root, and then down to the fifth again, that A, because that leads into the G of the next chord. Then I did a G sharp diminished seven chord, okay, which is a half diminished seven rather, which is the which is the two chord in the key of F sharp minor, which we're kind of modulating to here. So that's sort of, you know, that you can look at the G here as, as the, um, you know, the G sharp, this, this chord is like the, our pivot chord kind of, um, well, not exactly a pivot chord because it doesn't belong to, to B, um, B minor. Well, it's kind of ambiguous here at the beginning of this example because we have the B going to B minor. So we're not, we're not really sure what key we're in if we, we were going to talk about a theory a little bit here because um, it goes from B major to B minor, then D major to D minor. So it's kind of... But by this point, we're establishing... We're, it's, it's kind of getting more established as we go along here. Um, and by the end, we we're definitely in F sharp minor. So, so I wanted to sort of tonicize things here. So this two chord, half diminished seven, goes to a five chord in F sharp minor, five seven. Right. So getting and then so I guess we're talking about the harmony now. We'll get back to the bass, but and then that goes to an F chord, which is a type of leading tone chord really to F sharp minor um, and then we have the C sharp augmented which is the uh, altered dominant chord finally to the F sharp minor so let's get back to the bass here we had like I said we had the D chord we have a D chord outlined here the D minor chord in uh, measure 4 and then in measure 5 we go to G uh, for the first half, and then for this G sharp half diminished seven, I went to the. I had the bass do the, the third of the chord. And then it, because I wanted to do, I wanted some movement in the bass here. So then it steps down to A, and then to G sharp here, which is actually the fifth of the C sharp seven, um, dominant chord. Because I want to do a five. Five one here, sort of. Um, well, not exactly, but I wanted this movement in the bass. So then it goes to the root of the chord, and then that steps down, and then for the penultimate measure, we have an A, which is the third of the F chord, and then C sharp root to... So we had the basic sort of 5 to 1 here in the bass, C sharp to F sharp. And that's it. So we can listen to that and see what it sounds like. Okay, so now let's let's um I think I went over everything. Let me just sorry, I'm trying to do this on the fly. I have some notes here, but All 
All right, so let's, so in this first part here of the first, uh, we're going to split up this video probably into winds, brass, strings. I mean, we're going to have a series of videos here, winds, brass, strings, and then com combinations. So this is going to be part one. So let's just focus on the winds here. All right, so we're going to start with flute. If I can make sure this is working here. All right, so let me just transpose this keyboard here. So if you if you remember this, here's the middle C in the flute, and then so here's the B above that. Let's just listen to. I'm gonna just play through this for a second. Okay, so that sounds pretty good in the flute, I think. All right, so let me just, we're gonna play that in so we can record it here. And then we're gonna move it, I'm gonna let you hear it, you're gonna hear it in um, the oboe and clarinet just to, to get a sense of it here. Here we go. All right, I need my metronome here. Metronome is so loud. Okay, so there's, let me shut the metronome off for now. Okay, so that's, that works for the flute, right? And that's a certain type of character. Now. Let's copy it into the oboe. And let's listen to just the oboe now. Let me mute this. Okay, it kind of works, but it's getting a little high up there, like we talked about. So I would probably shy away from that. Because to me, that's not... It's sort of stepping outside its range. I mean, I would say the first half of the melody, it's fine. And that's another thing we'll talk about later, but... Because we could have the melody start in the oboe, then go to the flute. But as it gets higher there, it's sort of losing its character and it's getting a little pinched so so I'd probably shy away from that maybe at least for the second half okay let's listen to the uh, clarinet here Okay, so that works nice, I think. So we have some choices to make here. And there are a lot of options, especially when you're dealing with woodwinds here. So, let's, uh, so that's it for the melody here. Th those can, now you can also, like we talked about, we could double, and we're gonna get into this more when we, 
when we do the um, harmony, but because you have to think about ranges here. But um, I'm not going to deal with octave doublings right now, probably. Um, so let's just go to the harmony here. So the top note of the harmony, let's look at the range of that. So for now, here's what we're going to do for now. We're going to stick with, we're going to keep it simple and stick with the flute playing the melody here, okay? And I'm going to double that, the Berlin with the VSL flute here, so that we have, because in the orchestra we have a flute section, which usually wins in pairs. So this is what it sounds like when they're together. So now, this top note of the harmony, we have a couple options here. We could do either clarinet, well I, see I'd probably go with the oboe here, because it sits nicely in the oboe's range. The clarinet can play lower, so I might wanna, I'm gonna save that for the lower parts of the harmony here. So we have two oboes, so what we could do is we could have the there's now there's different ways to do this with the chord. It's really interesting and we'll we'll talk about the different ways. But let's first let's get this top part of the melody down and then we'll talk about what we're gonna do. So for the first oboe I'm gonna do this top part of the melody here. So my keyboard is I'm not sure where middle C is because I just transpose it. Okay here it is. So, we're so here's the top part of the melody here. Is okay, so let's let's lay that in here. We get the click click going again. So this is oboe one. Is going to play the top part of those chords, and I'll keep putting that in so you can refer to the uh, example here. Okay, here we go. Where does it come in here? Okay, measure three here. Messed up. Gotta count. Okay, looks good. Let me just check the thing at the end here. All right, put a little breath in here. That's another thing you got to think about breathing with when you do these things. I'm gonna come out here. Oops. I'll put a, uh, a pencil here. All right, so I'm not gonna obsess with this stuff. So that works, right? It sounds nice. Now, so let's do the second part of the chord. I'm going to do for that for oboe two. Oh, uh, the next note down. Now you notice also we have some five note chords here, or rather four note co chords. Most of them are three note, so we're going to have to deal with that too. But. Um, so anyway, let's do the second note of the chord here. So we got to think about voice leading now. 
So let me make sure. Second note down, I should say, of the chord. So here's our the next oboe here. I'm just going through this. If you refer to the example here, I'm going to go D sharp, F sharp, F sharp, then to A, and then B, then I'm going to hold that B and hold it again, and then down to A here. All right, and then we're going to put those extra notes in here too with, we'll probably have to well, that's what we're going to have to bring some clarinets in here. And we will. All right, so let's go with this, this line here. Okay, good. Now before I go to the, all right, let me just, I'm going to go to the bottom note of the chord before we start adding these doublings here. Actually, we're going to, I mean, uh, these extra notes in the four note chords. So let's, let's go to the, the um, clarinet now. So let me just go through what I'm going to do here. B, D, hold that D over, and then F, and then G, G sharp, G sharp, E sharp, and then hold that for the next chord, and then up, resolve on the F sharp here. Okay, then we're going to talk about some extra notes here. Actually, I might hold that G sharp. See, here's where you have to kind of make some decisions here. Okay, I know what to do here. See, the thing is, you don't want to... These notes have certain tendencies, and you don't want to to, uh, you know, strand them with that. So this G sharp and the C sharp 7 chord, that's got to go up to A, which is the third of the F chord. Alright, so that, that wants to resolve to that A there, and not fall down to F. So you have to kind of follow those tendencies. Whereas that E sharp, which is F, is going to carry over to F there. If that makes sense. So this is kind of an example where you would probably omit certain notes that you don't need in those chords. But I kind of like 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 that for now. So here we go. We're gonna we're gonna you're gonna. I'll show you what I do after I kind of play it in here and see if it works. G sharp, then go to A, now what happened was, is that started to double, double the oboe there, the second oboe, 
which is okay, I don't mind that. So now we need to deal with the extra notes here in the other clarinet. And this is going to help us get to the F in the penultimate measure, which finally resolves the F sharp. So I'll show you what happens here. Yeah, we're going to have to go B. It's going to be a leap here in the when we in measure one, two, three, measure six is going to be a leap here in the clarinet. You'll see. Let me just take a look at that clarinet we just did for a second. I want to make sure I'm on. Okay. All right. So let me put these extra notes in here. So the extra note will come in on that G-sharp half-diminished 7 chord, which is the fifth measure in. And if you look at what we have, let's look at what we have. Okay. We have the G going to G-sharp, so we have the brute here. We have the third, and we have the seventh. So we need, see this D here, we need to continue that from the flute. We're going to now have the clarinet play it. But then that D is going to actually going to jump down to Let's see, D, now let's look at the next chord here. We're missing the, the C sharp. So that's good, the D is going to then go to the C sharp, and then that is going to leap down to the E sharp or the F. So that's a, a leap of a minor six, which is, a, is actually okay, and that's something even the voice, that's the thing you got to think about the voice. The human voice could, could sing that. A singer would have no problem with singing a six, so that's fine. So let me just play what, what that's going to do then. So we're going to start with that D, and then it's going to go to down to C sharp, and then F. And then it's going to stay on that F. So that's a nice line there if you listen to that. Right? You see? Okay, so here we go. Okay, so that's nice there. I think that, and if we look at just the clarinets here, let's just solo the clarinets here. So I like that. So we're trying to kind of keep it in simple here for now. Now what I was talking about before is you could swap out these, it, what's called um, sort of inter, interleaving these parts. So in other words, you could have, if, if you have like a f four note chord there, you could have something like uh, clarinet, oboe, clarinet, oboe, going from bottom to top. So you can kind of like interweave them so that 
it's a nice timbral sound there. I mean, there's a lot of things you could rearrange rearrange the chord like that, but we're going to keep it pretty simple for now. Um, and I think the clarinet, it sounds better at that lower range, so so I think it's good to keep them for the bottom two notes there. Um, it does get a little higher there towards the end, which is nice. So let's listen to the woodwinds. Before we add the bass notes, we're going to let's listen to what we have again. So let's deal with the bass here. So we could use bass clarinet, but we're gonna keep it straightforward and use, we're gonna get a different color in there. We're gonna use the bassoon. Okay, so let's, let's do that here. That's too high. I gotta transpose the keyboard. Okay, here we go. Okay, that sounds good, I think. So let me just double that with the VSL here. Okay, sounds really nice. So, why is the bass better that way? Well, I think it, the ear, you know, there, there have been studies that show that when people listen to music, they hear the what's happening in the outer extremes, so they hear the, the melody and the bass. The, the ear tends to gravitate towards those, so, so that's why I think putting more interest in the bass line there works for this. I mean, it depends on the situation, but let's listen to just the um, outer voices here, and you'll see what I mean here. Okay, so let me show you a variation where I omitted some of the chord tones um, that were either doubled or implied. Okay, so this is going to help us if we also I did a deceptive cadence at the end for some reason. <laughs> but um, this is going to help us when we if we want to do an arrangement with strings or and, you know and we don't want to do a lot of divisi so let's try this actually um, so the bass line's the same I just changed so we'll keep the bassoon the same so let me move some of this stuff over here And then we could do a different example here. So I'm going to 
So this way we can also keep the oboes playing the same part. We don't have to split them up. And we'll same with the clarinet. So let's let's do do this here. Actually, I do have to change those bass notes because, like I said, I did a deceptive cadence at the end. So these are going to down to D. So then, let me just check this. I think it's okay, though. B there and the that skip of a from the F to B. So this is where we kind of run into trouble here. I may change the bass to B. So we have the seventh and the bass, and then um put the root in the the oboe there, so that, hold on, so you see the skip here, I'd rather go to, it sound better to go here, maybe, I don't know, this is hairy. So what I would do also is change this, keep this B here. Mm, I don't know, man. Bag this whole idea. It's hard to tell right now. Put in the clarinet and see. This oboe's kind of loud too. Take it down a little. Not bad. Let me um take this oboe down a little. Something.
All right, so that's another option. I don't know if I like it as much, but just to show you how to uh, do that. Um, you take, you know, you can see how I took away some of the chord tones here. I changed from that example. I changed that, like I said, in the bass. Um, it's going from the G sharp to the B and staying there instead of G sharp, C sharp. So it's changing the inversion there because I didn't like that skip of the oboe from E sharp to B, which would be like a tritone. Um, so I went from E sharp to C sharp. Okay, so that that's the end of uh, our first part of this orchestration tutorial. So like I said, the next part we're going to uh, tackle the brass, and then the f part three will be strings, and then part four will be combinations of things. Okay, see you next time.